Davy was a big pioneer in a branch of chemistry called electrochemistry. And the simplest definition we can give for electrochemistry is simply the study of chemical and electrical energy. Or more specifically, the conversion between chemical energy and electrical energy. Are these reactions going to occur spontaneously? Are they non-spontaneous? If they're non-spontaneous, what do we have to do to make them become spontaneous? So there's a couple processes that we're going to look at. And we kind of you know, put these into two categories. Category number one of electrochemistry is the generation of an electric current from a chemical reaction. And these reactions are redox reactions or oxidation reduction reactions. And they were introduced to us way back in section 4.4 of our textbook. So we briefly talked about oxidation states and oxidation reduction in the conductivity lab that you guys analyzed. So if you still need to brush up on your oxidation states, look back in section 4.4 of the textbook. And I would highly recommend you read through those and do the first couple tutorials on mastering chemistry. So the first type is this generating an electric current from a particular chemical process. This type of process is sometimes referred to as a galvanic or voltaic cell. And in a galvanic cell, it's a device in which chemical energy is changed into electrical energy. And this is going to be a spontaneous process. So in a galvanic cell, we can set up our cell. A chemical reaction is going to occur. And it's going to occur without any outside interve intervention. The second type of a process that we can analyze in, electro in electrochemistry is the use of an electric current to produce a chemical change. The cell that we construct in this particular process is called an electrolytic cell. And in an electrolytic cell, electrical energy is changed into chemical energy by the use of a current. And this is a non-spontaneous process. In our traditional labs, if we were doing an electrochemistry experiment, we would have day number one where you use a galvanic cell. And in that galvanic cell, you put everything together and you measure the voltage across two different metals. If you measure that voltage across the metals, you don't have to plug your machine in. The electrolytic cell that the students would perform on day number two, you have to plug this machine into the wall because you're taking a non-spontaneous reaction and using electrical energy 
to produce some type of a change. This is the type of process when you electroplate like a spoon or your chrome wheels on a particular car. The chrome doesn't just jump right onto the tire. You have to use an electroplating process in order to do that. So these are the type of processes that we have. And the question is, how do we take these two observations that we talked about and build a cell or build a battery that can actually function and capture this flow of electrons. So we have to come up with some type of convention in order to do this. So the convention that we come up with is to write these overall chemical reactions into two half reactions. So typically we have an oxidation half reaction where we show the species that's being oxidized. In this case, zinc as a solid has an oxidation state of zero. That zinc solid gets converted into zinc ions in solution. If we have a zinc two plus cation, its oxidation state is plus two. If our oxidation number or our oxidation state goes from zero to plus two, it's being oxidized. To balance this half reaction, we have to show the two electrons that are being transferred. <coughs> if we have an oxidation half reaction, or if oxidation occurs, reduction also has to occur in that particular reaction. So here we have copper 2 plus as aqueous ions in solution, plus two electrons. It's going to give us copper solid. In this case, the copper goes from an oxidation state of plus two to an oxidation state of zero. When we have an overall chemical reaction, we need to add up both of the half cell reactions. So in this particular case, we're gonna have zinc solid plus copper two plus Then we have two electrons on the reactant side and two electrons on the product side. So they're going to cancel each other out. And the products then are going to be zinc 2 plus in aqueous solution plus copper solid. So this is our overall chemical reaction for the, the spontaneous process that's occurring here. We're going to talk a little bit later about a couple of reactions where we can look at the potential or the electricity that we can get from a particular process like this. So back in the day, scientists were performing these types of experiments. Ben Frank Franklin goes out, flies a kite, attaches a key to it. That's the famous experiment that he did. Ben Franklin convinced most people that these electricity experiments are actually science and not just some fancy little trick that you can do at a parlor or at a party. Okay? Alessandro Volta, the namesake for the voltaic cells, he made some observations. They looked at all this stuff. I can tell you guys this because you're not performing this experiment this quarter, but if he wrote down that if you take dissimilar metals or different metals and touch them to your tongue, you get this like bitter taste in your mouth. He also said that if you take these metals and put them up into your eye and touch them to your eye, you get these flashing sensations. So what the heck is this stuff doing? And you know, another thing is why the heck are these guys doing this stuff, right? I mean, putting metals in your eyes is a lot safer than going out and trying to fly a kite in a lightning storm. Because Ben Franklin gets a lot of credit. He also should get credit for having the poor souls that tried to repeat his experiment that got struck by lightning and got electrocuted and died. So how do we take this chemical energy and put it to good use? And that's one of the things that we're still talking about today. And Back in the day, it was we came up with these alkaline or these nickel-cadmium batteries. Nickel-cadmium batteries were awesome 
if you had a device like I did back on the school bus in middle school called a Walkman, they played these things called cassette tapes. Okay, I thought I was the coolest kid on the school bus listening to MC Hammer every day. All right. <coughs> then they came out with these CD players, right? And the batteries that used to be awesome for this Walkman and last forever, they like were dead in minutes. Go out and buy these old little Duracell batteries before they get all vamped up and try to put them in your digital camera and see how long they last. We blow through batteries like this all the time. So we can't even power a little tiny screen on a camera, let alone the big screen over here on a laptop. So how, how do we improve the quality? They came out with these lithium ion batteries, right? And the first thing that happened was they were so, the reactions were so exothermic, they got so hot that your computer would catch on fire. So Dell had to recall all of these batteries back, okay? How can we effectively put to use chemical energy and use it for electrical energy. There's a big balance that we have to use. So before we can jump into all the battery stuff, we have to set the foundation with what we would describe as a cell. And we can look at various cells and we can describe what's going on. If you look in the figures of your textbook, chemists have a little convention of how they would set these things up and what they would look like. 